We are really thrilled to have everybody here today. This is wonderful to see such a crowd. You're in for a major treat. You're going to get a double dose. You're going to get from not only one historian, but from two. And they are going to work together, and it's going to be fun. Uh, Ambrose, I'm sure, is known by everyone who is here, and he is quite a draw for the community. <laughs> he is a historian. He is a native. He went to NC State, my school, which I love. Go back. <laughs> Go look back. And, and he also has started his own business. Welcome, Alan. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, he also started his own business, which was an international uh, import business. And um, you don't want to hear me talk, but he's done numerous things. He's served on numerous boards. He is just a major asset to our community. We also have with us Bruce Johnson, who is another historian and writer. He has written numerous books and has won numerous awards. And he lives right up this road from us in Fairview, North Carolina, right outside of Charlotte. And he all, I mean, Asheville. And he also has a little place over in Lake Lore. And um, he, has, he is quite an authority on uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald. And he is getting ready to write another book uh, on our own Eleanor Vance and uh, Charlotte. Charlotte. Charlotte Vance and El whatever. <laughs> <laughs> the brain is sort of fried ever since I fell and bumped my head. It was almost gone then, but it's gotten worse. So anyway, um, the, he, the book about F. Scott Fitzgerald. We have in the back, Margaret Carroll will be glad to um, sell you a copy for $20, <coughs> which $10 will go to the museum. So I hope that y'all will pull out your pocketbooks and get a book. And Bruce has kindly said he will personalize it for us. So thank you so much for coming today. And please come and visit the museum often, not just when we have our tales. Thank you. Welcome to all of you here. I'm delighted to be here and, and um, be, say more about Bruce in a bit. Uh, you know, in this museum we've had a program on William Gillette, we've had one on Hawthorne Wingo. Uh, there's been a lot of famous people here that have been recognized. But very few people here realize that we also were host to Scott Fitzgerald back in the 30s. I was alive at that time, but a bit young and don't remember anything about that. <laughs> I, I've been kind of a fan of Fitzgerald and intrigued by some of the stories of his life and his <laughs> notorious adventures and his misfortunes and thought it would be good if I, here in Tron we knew more about it. Uh, I dressed up like this because I wanted to look like Robert Redford in, in, in uh, The Great Gatsby, the 1974 movie. <laughs> but I'm afraid I came up a little short, about half a foot short. <laughs> and also about 50 years later. But probably Redford looks a little different than he did in 1974 too. But over the years, we always heard about Scott Fitzgerald visiting here and staying in the O'Call and his time visiting in Missledine. We'll hear more about that later, but I'm delighted to have Bruce Johnson tell us more about Scott Fitzgerald and, and Zelda. I was kind of intrigued with Zelda too, so much so that about four or five months ago, we got a new dog a great dane poodle mix and she, and she she's a little bit schizophrenic and i named, I named her zelda fitzgerald 
Rouge, and, and I, have to, I have to add to that story, I once had a Jack Russell Terrier. If you know anything about Jack Russell, you understand why I called her Zelda. <laughs> she was definitely crazy. Uh, thank you for coming here uh, this afternoon. I, I appreciate it. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I stood in front of 1,200 people, and I have also stood in front of one person. And it's much easier to talk to a full house than it is to have one person show up for your talk. So thank you for coming. Um, I was a former high school English teacher years ago, so if you, get, if you feel inclination to get up and go back and something to drink or whatever, it won't bother me. I, can, I always said, if you can stand in front of 30 high school seniors, you can stand in front of anybody. So, she'll go to another one. Um, as has been mentioned tonight, we have, uh, this is my latest book. Um, the funny thing about this book is it was probably the easiest, most enjoyable of my 14 books to write, and it's got the most publicity recently. Uh, not because of me, but because of the, uh, the title characters, Tom, Scott, and Zelda. And what it is you'll find out tonight, if you happen to buy a copy of the book, is it follows their adventures in Asheville, in Hendersonville, Lake Lure, and Tryon. Uh, because all, all three of them were there at different times. And so if, uh, it's uh, sort of a combination brief biography. It's not a scholarly work in terms of you got to you know, get through the footnotes. Uh, but it'll also take you, if you want to go up to Hendersonville and see where Fitzgerald hung out up there on Main Street, and go out to uh, the Oakdale Cemetery and see the angel. It'll show you how to get there. Same way with going up to Asheville and seeing where Zelda met, met her demise, as we'll get to in a little bit. Um, my interest in them began when I was actually a junior in high school. I, write my, I wrote my junior high school term paper on Scott and Zelda. And, um, and so I've been fascinated with them and had no idea. I was living in Iowa at that time in Illinois. I had no idea that I'd end up living in Asheville, where Fitzgerald spent three years of his life, along with Zelda, who spent a few more years than him, and uh, Tom Wolfe. So it was a, a treat for me. Scott and Zelda, uh, as you probably know a little bit about them, uh, Scott was born in 1896, Zelda in 1900. Uh, Zelda was the Belle of Montgomery, Alabama, and she met Scott when he was stationed down there. One of Scott's biggest laments, uh, he enlisted in the, in the Army, was that he never got shipped overseas. Uh, he always felt that he could have written better stories if he'd been overseas and had something to write about. He was always <laughs> jealous of Hemingway for Hemingway's war experiences. Uh, Zelda spurned um, Scott's, uh, Scott, Scott's proposals when they were both together in Montgomery, Alabama, because he was just another soldier. And she, like I say, was the Belle of Montgomery. However, uh, in 1920, I always have to check my dates, 1920, Scott wrote a novel, and he was age 24, called This Side of Paradise, and became a bestseller. And suddenly, Zelda decided she would marry him. <laughs> you got money in your pocket, it, it, it kind of worked. Unfortunately, it was probably one of the worst matches that we could imagine. Uh, they were very destructive of each other as their life went along. Um, so, and, and they didn't know how to handle the money. Uh, Scott was 24, she was 20 when they got married, and you read about some of their exploits uh, in, you know, in splashing in the, in the fountain at the plaza, uh, <laughs> spending, you know, riding around, spending, you know, summers in Europe, and doing everything they can to, to get headlines. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, um, <coughs> click on that, see if that shows. Yeah. Sad little girl in between the two of them, their daughter, their only daughter, Scotty. Uh, Scotty was born in 1821, um, primarily spent, and talk about two uh, ill-fated couples, uh, they were ill-fated parents as well. Scotty spent her entire life in boarding schools, uh, never really got to spend much time with her parents, which probably you can make a case was a good thing. Uh, uh, both Scott and Zelda soon became alcoholics. Uh, very, like I said, it's just very self-destructive. Scott continued to write. Um, take the next one there, Shields. And in 1925, came out with The Great Gatsby. Interesting thing about The Great Gatsby is it didn't make Fitzgerald any money. Uh, his daughter made far more, more money off The Great Gatsby than Fitzgerald ever did. It was actually a commercial flop. Um, and so um, he, 
and about the same time, 1929, we're going to introduce our other uh, uh, star here. Thomas Wolfe writes, you know, look homeward angel. Uh, Thomas Wolfe didn't spend as much time in Tryon as Fitzgerald did, which is probably a good thing, because if you know anything about Look Homer and Angel, you know that anybody that um, Thomas Wolfe met and grew up with in Asheville, he threw under the bus uh, and, <laughs> and got uh, pretty much slammed in Look Homer and Angel. Um, Fitzgerald basically had to go from writing novels to writing short stories. They were far more lucrative. He can make upwards to three thousand dollars writing a short story, whereas the royalties from his books paled in comparison. Um, take the next one there, Seal. Um, this picture of the two of them later in life um, gives you an idea of, of, of how if you'll watch the body language between the two of them. Um, unfortunately, Zelda at age in 1930, which she would be what 30 years old, she was born in 1900. She was admitted to the first sanitarium that she would spend most of the rest of her life in. Um, Scott, she and Scott were in Switzerland, uh, and um, so she was institutionalized and uh, diagnosed as a schizophrenic. Zelda spends most of the rest of her life in and out of sanitariums at a time when, unfortunately, they did a lot of nasty experiments. Uh, insulin shock treatments where they would literally overdose her and they would go into convulsions and the idea would be then they would shake the the evils out of the body uh, that in electroshock treatments and sometimes you want to be horrified google electroshock treatments they basically took a car battery and stuck it on either side of her temples uh, <coughs> again the idea was that this was going to cure her and poor zelda probably ended up making her worse rather than better go to the next one um, while Zelda is in institutions in Europe and then in um, uh, Baltimore as well, Scott, in the 1935, thinks he has tuberculosis. And so he did what a lot of people did in the 30s. They went to the mountains. And so Scott shows up 1935 in Asheville. And this is what Pack Square looked like at this time. Um, it, you know, the Vance Monument is still there. There should be something of a familiar uh, photograph to you. Right back here, where today is the 15-story Jackson building with the gargoyles on the top, that was Thomas Wolfe's father's tombstone shop back there. Um, so 1935, Fitzgerald shows up in Asheville. He never had tuberculosis. Uh, he was, um, you know, he was suffering from alcoholism, from a dependency on drugs, and uh, basically it was run down. He was never in very good health. And so the doctors here, they treat he wanted to stay at the Grove Park Inn. Well, the first thing the Grove Park Inn did was make sure that he didn't have tuberculosis because the Grove Park Inn did not allow tuberculosis people to check in there. You had to go off to one of those shanty wooden uh, boarding houses. So take the next one then. The Grove Park Inn, um, as, as some of you may know, I'm sure you've all been up there or by it or seen it, uh, built in 1913 in the arts and crafts style by E.W. Grove. <laughs> Uh, who himself had come to Asheville from St. Louis because he thought he was having lung ailments as well. Grove got here, the mountaineer reinvigorated him, he started buying up, eventually owned 1,200 acres of land in North Asheville and was selling building lots. And when the building lot business kind of slowed, he got the idea, well, I'll build a hotel. And then I'll build a hotel, not for the commoners, but for the elite. And the idea would be that the politicians and the business people from New York and Chicago and Boston would come down to Asheville and stay at the Grove Park Inn. And so this is what it, it looked like at that time. Um, obviously a lot of changes since then, um, but a wonderful place. Take our next one. You got to get it right on that one, double click. Oh, no, get right there. Now he can go. And we'll see the Great Hall. Uh, changed a lot. I've been there lately. You see, the Grove Park Inn has undergone some, you know, different managers and interior decorators. But this is what it looked like. It was very somber in 1913. Uh, wicker rockers, a lot of rocks, Roycroft chandeliers. Uh, but this is where Fitzgerald hung out. Um, go to the next one. This is what the rooms looked like back then. Again, furnished in the arts and crafts style. 
Um, notice twin beds, no queen or king beds back then. Uh, lots of furniture. They packed a lot of furniture into the rooms back then. Burlap, wallpaper, and this is where Fitzgerald stayed. He was in room 441. Most people, when they go to the Grove Park Inn, you have your two choices. You can look out the windows to the west, across the golf course, out to the mountains. Most people want to do that, got a better view. Fitzgerald wanted to be on the side overlooking the parking lot. He wanted to see people as they were coming in. Uh, even though Fitzgerald never once, I, I, I'm going to give him credit before I give him criticism. Number one, never divorced Zelda, even though she was a Looney Tune, never divorced her. Number two, never put her in what we used to call the county home. He put her in the best class sanitariums there were. And so he was always broke because he was always paying for her sanitariums. Um, the criticism, he was terribly unfaithful. Uh, you know, he had you know, affairs all over the place, including at the Grove Park Inn. Um, let's go to one more slide. This is what Scott looked like in 1935. Um, when he was there, he stayed in rooms 441 and 443. Uh, the rooms at the Grove Park Inn have inner uh, connecting doors. And so if you stayed there, as he did, for months at a time, they would take the bed out of one room and set up a couch in there. So Fitzgerald had 441 as his writing studio. He did some writing there. And then the other room was his, the bedroom. Uh, he entered into an affair with a married woman when he was there in 1935. Um, the story goes that um, she just happened to be in the Great Hall reading a copy of The Great Gatsby. And Fitzgerald's pickup line was, <coughs> Why read the book when you can have the real thing? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently it worked. Until her husband found out. And then her husband shows up. And that's when Fitzgerald decides that maybe the Grove Park Inn isn't the place he needs to be staying. And so he does a lot of um, hotel hopping. He stays at the Vanderbilt Hotel downtown. He goes to the, uh, uh, the Battery Park Hotel for a while under assumed names. He ducks down to Lake Lure, the state the Lake Lure Inn, for a weekend. And he comes to Triumph and spends, uh, spends time in the, uh, in the Oak Hall Hotel. Next slide. Uh, this is, I just found this photograph not too long ago, and I'm almost embarrassed to show it. He's in a body cast. Fitzgerald, when he went to Fitzgerald went to Princeton to jump back for a ways, actually went out for the football team, even though he was not a very big person. Lasted one day on the football team. Um, always considered himself to be an athlete. And so he was at Beaver Lake in North Asheville showing off for Zelda. And at this time, Zelda, he had brought Zelda from Baltimore, put her in a sanitarium in Asheville, the Highlands Hospital, and he would check her out. He had an old Packard. And he would go over and get Zelda, and they would go on outings. And he took her out to Beaver Lake, and he got up on the 20-foot high dive to show off, hit the water wrong, and basically broke his collarbone. And the treatment back then for that, this is a cast. He's got a, his arm is, is like this for six weeks. This is a cast. It went all the way down, and unfortunately, this is his beer belly. Um, and he's standing next to this very uncomfortable person who was probably his nurse or his assistant. He had to dictate his stories and his letters and everything. Uh, probably the most unflattering portrait you will ever see of Fitzgerald. Um, a little bit later, when I'm going to turn it over to Ambrose now, a little bit later you see a far more flattering portrait that was painted of him here in, uh, in Tryon by David Silvet. Um, but as I said, he was staying at the Grove Park Inn for most of 1935 through 1937. But in January 1937, he really moved into the Oak Hall Hotel. And he was trying to dry himself out. Uh, spending time with his friends Nora and Lefty Flynn and at that point I'll, I'm going to turn things over to Ambrose and he's going to talk more about uh, what it was like in Tryon at that time and then I'll take it over a little bit later and kind of wrap things up and throw in a little Tom Wolfe story here in Tryon. Well I never met Scott Fitzgerald but I did meet Lefty Flynn. Lefty Flynn was a famous horseman here, lived at Little Orchard in the hunting country and some, some of our friends will know exactly about that. Uh, Tryon looked about like this in the 40s when I grew up here. 
and it hasn't changed a hell of a lot since then, <laughs> which, which is a good thing for me. I liked it the way it was, I liked it the way it is. Uh, in my life, I've traveled a lot of places, and I never found anything I liked as much as trying. No matter where I've grown, my heart was always here in trying. Amen. Oak Hall was built uh, in 1882 by T.T. Ballinger, who was mayor of Triumph for several times. And it was uh, very useful to the people who came after the railroad came through town. Uh, it brought people from the north, from Midwest, and they often stopped at the station in Triumph, and the livery would pick them up and haul them up the hill to Oak Hall. It changed hands many times, uh, people including uh, Nelson Jackson, the cloth of gold guy, uh, Williams, and finally in uh, right 1948, uh, it was bought by Clara Edwards, Miss Clara, who's legend with everybody here, and uh, my association with Oak Hall was in the 50s when we would have dinner parties there and served by Theodore King mm -hmm. and looked after by Miss Clara who taught me how to use seven pieces of silver. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of famous people stayed at uh, Oak Hall. David Niven, Henry Ford, uh, McCarthy, a uh, famous uh, movie director. Oak Hall was the center of uh, social events. New Year's Eve parties were held there. The uh, civic organizations, Rotary, Kiwanis had their luncheons there. I remember appearing with the Kiwanis Club and thinking how, how good they were to support the schools in those days. Uh, in, included in the staff besides Ted King was Nani Robinson and Pearlie Booker, who was uh, also a friend of our family. Miss Clara ran the hotel until the 70s. It, uh, it, shows, it shows its age a little bit in, in this film, in this slide. Uh, it was very difficult to maintain it. And nobody ever said this, but it looked to me as though it would have been one hell of a fire hazard. <laughs> but uh, finally, finally, Miss Clara's health started to fail, and running this big organization was demanding for her, and she decided she'd sell it. However, as I just indicated, it's a bit of a white elephant, and very difficult to sell. And finally, she had to uh, despair making a sale, and in October 1979, they decided they dismantled it and took it down. I, I, I wasn't living in town at the time. I wish I'd been here to get some artifacts from that a door or a table, but uh, now it's been replaced by the Oak Hill Condos, and it's a lovely, lovely place, but it never can replace Oak Hall. It would look like this when Scott Fitzgerald came. He, he came, first came with his daughter Scotty, who was about 13 at the time, and his friends Lefty and Nora Flynn uh, would not have that teenager living in the hotel and brought them to their home, Little <coughs> Orchard. I remember Little Orchard when Jane Gagne and her lovely daughters Annette and Suzette lived there. Lefty and Nora uh, had come from New York and sometimes in California where Lefty, who was a star football player at Princeton, Yale, yeah. Yale one, and uh, he was a kick record field goals with his left foot. And that's how I got the name of Lefty, not particularly by being left-handed. Uh, he was on the a star on the other teams as well, but on the football team, he was ready, his, brought, he brought his team almost to the national championship, but he uh, met 
uh, a dance hall girl and married her and went and skipped school and went to Europe for a weekend or something. <laughs> and they, they, they kicked him out of, out of school. And he, he never made that national championship. But because he was a good looking guy, he was about 6'2", very athletic, he became a movie star in the silent film era and made about 40 silent films. And as I say, when I met him, he was still a fine looking big man, a uh, good horseman. And uh, he and Nora were kind of the social center of Tryon. They're very entertaining. They both had great singing voices and great stories to tell. So uh, uh, they were the center of social life and entertained often at Little Orchard. You see, that that was it. They're both good looking people. Nora was from the Langhorne family of Virginia, one of five sisters who were one of the headlines that promoting this in the Triumph Bulletin mentioned the name Notorious. It, I think that the Langhorne sisters were pretty notorious, and especially Nora. But uh, Nora had a daughter from a previous marriage, Joyce Grenfell, who was a famous comedian and actress in England. Uh, her sister was Lady Astor, married a lord there. And even though she was born in America, she became a member of Parliament in England. She and Winston Churchill did not like each other. Uh, so much so, this, I'm going to tell a vignette that may or may not be true, that uh, Lady Astor said to Winston, if you were my husband, I'd put arsenic in your coffee. And she said, if you were my husband, I'd drink it. <laughs> and he also said one time, uh, she said, you're, you're the drunkest guy I've seen in the parliament. And he said to her, and you're the ugliest woman I've seen. <laughs> and, he said, and then he said, but I'll be okay in the morning. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was not really likely to have happened. Because Lady Astor was a, a very beautiful woman. And I don't think the ugliest woman in Parliament would have fit her at all. You want the next one? Yeah. Put a Margaret. Oh, call. Yeah. Okay. Margaret Culkin Bannon, I met her too as well. She was a very prolific writer that lived here in town. And she wrote one book that I, I know was, I Took My Love to the Country, which was a, it had a, a synonym, of, but it was about Tryon, and you could identify characters in her story as people you knew in Tryon. They weren't they were so unflattering. <laughs> so oh, no, she was very complimentary. And if you notice on here, you know, Fitzgerald's getting top billing yeah. on this particular issue of McCall's, but notice Margaret Culkin Banny. Margaret was a far more successful writer than F. Scott Fitzgerald, and I really do believe she's somebody who deserves uh, a lot more research and attention. <laughs> and what's the name of her house? It's still here in Triumph. Friendly Hills. Yeah. Friendly, Friendly, Hills. Friendly Hills. Yeah. So I went right up over on the way to the country club. I went up and peeked in the windows one time. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of uh, more successful writers, uh, you, you, may have, you may tell a story when uh, Thomas Wolfe and his brother and sister came down to Grove Oak Hall to visit Scott Fitzgerald. Uh, during the conversation, somebody said, uh, have you read Gone with the Wind? And Scott says, I read all of it in two hours. And I didn't find two paragraphs that were good writing. And so his, his brother, Thomas Wolf, brother Fred said, you know, Scott and Tom, I wish that the two of you could have written money that made as much money <laughs> as Margaret Mitchell did. Uh, Fitzgerald was kind of a critic of contemporary authors, I believe. Oh, he was a critic of everybody. Yeah. So, <laughs> including Hemingway. There was a lot of, yeah, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. But we, I do want to show that next, the next shot to show uh, the David Silvette. Uh, mm -hmm. 
him this. This is more. This is more flattering than, than far more, than, far than, more. Than the one in the body cast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. David Solvent uh, was one of the artists who came to try on um, vacation here in the summers, and he was a, a very well-known portrait painter. And Nora introduced him to F. Scott Fitzgerald. <laughs> And the story goes that Sylvette painted this portrait of Fitzgerald, and Fitzgerald had given him $50 as a down payment. And then when it was finished, Fitzgerald came, came to see it and liked it, but he didn't have the other $200 to pay for it. So Sylvette kept it. And then in 1851, the first biographer tracked it down, and today it hangs in the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. <laughs> But uh, Sylvette did Fitzgerald a great favor with that particular one. I mentioned uh, Miss Clara and oh, call. Miss Clara was uh, in the post office for 20 years before she bought the hotel. And during that time, during her breaks from the post office, she would visit Miss Ledine's pharmacy, which was kind of a gathering place for the people uh, to go and, and have a drink, uh, not alcoholic. Uh, <laughs> and socialized. So it was on one of those occasions that she was sitting with Scott Fitzgerald and he pinned a, a poem on a napkin. And uh, she, he gave it to her. She said, I didn't think anything of it. I gave it to one of the employees at the drugstore. But it, it was uh, kind of a, a light-hearted, not a serious one. May I read it to you? Oh, Misseldine, dear Misseldine, a dive we'll never forget. The taste of its banana splits is on our tonsils yet. Its chocolate fudge makes liver fudge. It's really too divine. As we reel, we'll give one squeal for dear old Misseldine. <laughs> That, that poem written on a napkin seems to have disappeared over the years. Yeah, there was a 1977 newspaper article that said that it was last spotted inside the, the library. As I checked with the library to see if by any chance they had a napkin laying around, uh, <laughs> I suspect that somebody somewhere along the line, it has never surfaced. So the, most of the Fitzgerald papers are in Princeton. And uh, it's not there, but at least somebody had the good sense, even though, as Ambrose said, it's not a great literary work. Um, but somebody had the good sense to write the poem down before the napkin disappeared. <laughs> well, just a little bit more about Misseldine. Misseldine was made in 1896. Uh, Dr. Misseldine was a, a teacher and somehow got his pharmacal degree and opened the drugstore in a building that I mentioned it. And upstairs in this building was the office of Dr. Grady, whose name we've heard here many times before. So he and uh, Dr. Grady were, became the owners of the pharmacy, and finally he bought out Dr. Grady's part. The building that I'm referring to burned in 1913 and was rebuilt almost immediately. And uh, that's the same building that we still see today. It has gone through a couple of iterations. When uh, the Misseldine Pharmacy stopped, they uh, sold it, and Mrs. F.P. Bacon uh, put in the Blue Ridge Weaver's uh, gift shop. She then moved it further up on Packard Street. Uh, finally, it was. Uh, made into, along with the two adjacent buildings, into the Federal Savings Bank and stayed there until they moved down to the other end of town. And it was vacant then for several years and became a bit derelict. But it was rescued with some influence from Chris Ambrose uh, by Scott and Gail Lane. And what you see today is what the result of their efforts, along with redoing Sunnydale and the St. Luke's Plaza right here on our right. And the movie theater. And, and the movie now they're, yeah, they did the movie theater. So they've been great patrons. Okay. Uh, what, what was the address of Missile Dines? Where? 
precisely so that we can find it. Around uh, yeah. the corner, the corner, the corner of the train, and the south, across from the home. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, yeah. But yeah. oh, yeah. GPS won't yeah. find yeah. right about yeah. it. Well, of course, it's that thing. It's 13. Yeah. 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 South Trade, 13 South Trade. Real quick, I'll wrap things up here, and I'll bring in our other our other hero, Tom Wolf. Um, who in 1929 uh, wrote Look Homeward Angel, and as I mentioned, uh, this was a memoir of his life growing up in Asheville, uh, in which he you know, proceeded to pretty much skewer about 300 different people, to the point where he left Asheville and never came back for about seven years, um, until he figured out that maybe they never forgave him, but uh, when, once he became famous, they, were, they allowed him to come back in. Let's go to the next one. Um, I have to double click on that shield to get that open. Here, no, no more. Uh, if you haven't been up to it, the Thomas Wolfe Memorial, great, you know, when you're up in Nashville sometime, just off of a way a little ways from downtown, uh, a well restored house, as you may know, it, it had, bad, had a bad fire damage several years ago, but it's all been restored and they have a wonderful staff there. If you haven't been through it, I really recommend it sometime. We'll go to the next one. Um, we were mentioning earlier about um, they had the same editor. We have uh, on the far right there is Ernest Hemingway with Maxwell Perkins. Maxwell Perkins was the editor for Scribner's who worked with Fitzgerald, uh, both Fitzgeralds. Zelda wrote a very bad novel uh, that really made Scott upset because it was basically his plot. Um, so he worked with both Fitzgeralds, with Thomas Wolfe and with Ernest Hemingway. And was he was always wanting to have these three guys, I mean, his key writers were Fitzgerald, Wolfe, and Hemingway, and he always wanted them to be buds. And what he didn't realize is that all writers are basically jealous of each other and very insecure. And so even though he put these guys together at different um, luncheons in New York and encouraged them to go fishing, I love this, this picture. If you were going fishing with Ernest Hemingway, of course you would wear a suit and tie. <laughs> <laughs> Maxwell Perkins was always very buttoned up. Um, he had either three or five daughters, and so the, the, the psychoanalysts will always say that he saw these three as his sons that he never had. Uh, but he was always a little bit frustrated that he didn't become uh, a good buddies. If you go ahead and hit the next one, I'm going to move pretty fast. Have you seen the movie Genius? Yes. If you haven't, you should rent it sometime. It was not a commercial success, but it's a good movie about Thomas Wolfe and Maxwell Perkins. Um, you know, a couple, couple good editors, excuse me, a couple good actors in there as well. Uh, but if you ever get the chance to see Genius, it's very enjoyable. None of it was filmed uh, in Asheville or down here. It all takes place in New York. But uh, a great movie about, uh, about Thomas Wolfe, no doubt about that. Uh, take the next one then. 1937, Thomas Wolfe decides he's going to come back to Asheville. They, they welcome him back as a hero. And a, a childhood friend says, hey, I've got this cabin outside of town. I'll let you use it for the summer. And Tom Wolf rented this cabin. Take a look at the next one. I guess I'll move pretty fast here. And here are a couple pictures of them on the inside. Uh, basically, it became a party house. Uh, Wolf one time later lamented, he said, I would have had more privacy if I stayed in Times Square. Uh, because now he was a hero. You know, he's a best-selling novelist. And so people came out to see him out the cabin uh, during the summer of 1937. When he first got here, um, let's go to the next one. And I think this is, um, yeah. We'll jump ahead. January, well, May of 1937, uh, when, Fitz, when uh, Wolf gets to town, he wants to visit, uh, he, he feels an obligation to, to, uh, to hook up with Fitzgerald. Um, and he soon found out that Fitzgerald had moved to the Oak Hall Hotel. I kind of worn out his welcome at the Grove Park Inn, you know, so the kind of guy scooted him out the door. He was not considered a famous, successful author. I mean, Thomas Wolfe was far, far more famous in the 1930s than F. Scott Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald wrote stories about young love, and in the 1920s, that sold. In the middle of the Great Depression, eh, not so much. Uh, but that's, and so he came, literally came down to the Oak Hall Hotel to dry out. We'll go, we'll show the Oak Hall Hotel one more time. Um, and I do this because of the fact that on May 5th, 1937, um, as Ambrose talked about here, Wolf, who never learned to drive a car, 
um, got, got his brother Fred to drive he and his sister and his uh, famous mother Julia, who ran the old Kentucky home, down to Triumph. And they stopped for Hendersonville, had lunch, came the rest of the way down. Of course, there was no interstate, so they are taking the, the Saluda Road all the way down in whatever he was driving in 1937. And they met Fitzgerald out on the terrace. And Fitzgerald had set out a bottle of gin and two glasses. And, um, you know, they, Wolf never turned down a drink. And so they, you know, Wolf and Fred are they're throwing down these shots of gin, and Fitzgerald says, no, I'm, I'm on the wagon. He was drying out. He had one last chance, and that was to get tired by MGM as a screenwriter. But the stipulation was he had to dry out first. And so he came to try on, and Nora, Nora, helps, Nora probably helped him dry out. Uh, and so he lived here from January until July of 1937, then went to Hollywood and had a very unsuccessful career as a screenwriter in Hollywood. Uh, and at the ripe old age of 44, uh, has a heart attack and dies. And basically had, you could call it a heart attack, but I'm sure his liver probably said to his heart, I'm done. Uh, I can't take any more of this. And so he, he dies. Now, we'll go to the next one to wrap up our story here. Back in Asheville, however, is Zelda. Uh, Scott had brought Zelda down from Baltimore, put her in Highlands Hospital, a private sanitarium. And she was in there from 1936 until 1948. And here's where, you know, Dr. Carroll there was a highly respected, this was not one of those shady places. Dr. Carroll was a legitimate doctor, you know, was considered cutting edge. Now when we look back, we realize some of the experiments that they did, did more damage than they did good. And Zelda was one of those one of those people. When she went in, she was, she was considered quite uncontrollable, and so they did the electroshock treatments, and they considered her to be a success because she was subdued. Well, she subdued because they, they burnt brain cells out. You know, it was terrible what they did. And it turned her into sort of a semi-zombie. As a result, she got to the point where they said she was cured, and she could go home to Montgomery, Alabama, where her mother was still alive. And so Zelda goes back and stays with her mother in Montgomery, which didn't work out so well because it's like, you know, when she was in Montgomery, she was the belle of Montgomery. Her husband, her, her father was a judge, and she ends up being this schizophrenic that's bouncing around the country from sanitarium to sanitarium. And when she goes back to Montgomery, she's just reminded of the fact that her life was pretty much a waste. Um, and so in 1948, she decides to go back to Highlands Hospital for a tuna. Uh, I think she just needed to get away from her mother, probably. Uh, so she comes back and checks herself in, back into her room on the top floor of the Highlands Hotel. Unfortunately, as you know this, I'm sure you know the story, on the night of March 10th, 1948, a fire started in the kitchen, which was in the basement of this wooden structure. And this wooden structure had a dumb waiter. If you don't know what it, you guys all know what dumb waiters are. It's how you got the trays of food all up to the upper floors. The dumb waiter acted like a chimney. It just sucked that fire, heat rises right up, shot down the hallways. And the women, you know, there were 22 women in there at the time. Um, most of them on the ground floor, they got out. But there were nine who were locked in their rooms. They were sedated. And their windows had bars on them for their safety. And Zelda was one of those. And uh, so that night, nine women uh, burnt to death in, that, in, the, in the fire there. And unfortunately, Zelda was, was one of them. Go to the last one. I, I hate this story, how it ends on such a sad note. You know, we got, we got Fitzgerald dying of alcoholism. We got Zelda dying in the fire. Wolf ends up getting tuberculosis at age 38. He checks out. Um, if you've ever, you know, I don't think very many well, people do this, but I, I hunt down cemeteries. I, go, I love going to old cemeteries. In fact, I went up on top of the hill to see Miss, Miss Charlotte and Yale and, uh, and Eleanor up there. Um, that if you, if you went to there, this is their gravestone. Her ashes were discovered, were dug out of the rubble and sent to, uh, to Maryland and buried with Scott. And this is their joint tombstone, and it always looks like this. People leave copies of his novels. They leave martini glasses. Uh, sometimes they, I, don't, I don't understand the change. I don't understand why this, but pens. And even if you go out to Riverside Cemetery to Thomas Wolfe's um, 
a grave site. There's a, a, a cement urn there that people go out and put pens in, you know, to pay homage to their, their favorite writer. Um, do one more. What do we got? I think this is back to the book again. Right that way. Far more stories than what you know, we're talking about here in, in the book, and so I do. I think you will enjoy it, uh, but I'm not here to plug the book, other than the fact that the museum's going to benefit from it. So, uh, you know, $20, 10 of it's going to stay here with the museum, so hopefully you like it. <clears throat> Give me our last slide, so I'm going to put a plug in for one more thing. Um, I mentioned I'm working on a study of two, two of my favorite ladies who I never met. Uh, Elder Vance and Charlotte Yale, who started Tryon Toy Makers uh, when they, after they left Asheville. They were in Asheville from 1901 until 1915, uh, with the Vanderbilt's money started Biltmore Industries. But by 1915, they realized that their job was done in Asheville, and they kind of went looking for another challenge. They retired here to the little cottage. I've seen you guys, you all know this better than I do. Uh, and so retired here, and the townspeople came to them and said, would you do the same thing for our young people here that you did for the young people who lived on the estate of George Vanderbilt? Because Biltmore Industries was to give the estate workers' children a skill that they could use, wood carving and weaving, and uh, experiment with some basket making. And so that's what started, the, that's why they started Tryon Toy Makers and Wood Carvers uh, here in, in, uh, in Tryon. Uh, and then, you know, they gradually, you know, as you would expect, they, they grew older. Uh, they were friends with Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor came down here to see him. And then Eleanor invited them to come to the, to the Washington, D.C., which I think is the only trip they ever, only time they left town. As a biographer, you love personal letters. The problem with Eleanor and Charlotte is that they were inseparable. They met in college in Chicago in... Uh, be about 1898. They were always together. There are no letters between the two of them because they didn't need to write each other letters. They, there they all were. They lived together forever. Until 1954, Eleanor, who was just a year older, dies in 1954 here in uh, Tryon, and Charlotte dies four years later, 1958. Uh, they designed their own tombstone. It's up in the cemetery, up on top of the hill. Uh, you need to go up there and take a look at it sometime. It's beautiful, easy to find when you go. It's on the outer ring on the right-hand side. Um, if you know, I mean, 1954, 1958, not that long ago. I suspect there are people around town who might have some memory of the two of them. I would love to get in touch with them. Love to get in touch with them because of the fact that, uh, obviously, I didn't. Uh, with, I was back in Illinois growing up at that time. Um, but would love to talk to people who maybe remember them, even though they're going to remember them in their later years. Um, but would love to, so please uh, put them in touch with me. So, Ambrose, well, you, you wrap things up. Can I ask one question? Yeah, we we'll do lots of questions. So. Uh, Mrs. G, Mrs. Yale, was she related to the Yale Lock Company? No, no. It was a fallacy that she allowed to be, she was actually born, she was actually her, her mother was a, um, a maid in the Cheyenne Saloon, and her father was a bartender <laughs> at, in Cheyenne, Wyoming in 1870. The Civil War is just over. She was as far, she was further from the, I was probably closer to the Yale family than she was. And, and so this rumor got started that she was the descendant of the Yale family uh, that started Yale University. Well, I started doing a little bit of research what I found out later was that the Yale family didn't start Yale University. Yale lived in England, and it was a group of, of individuals, and I forget which, uh, which uh, religious affiliation, that started Yale University. They named it after a guy hoping he'd give them money. And so there was no Yale family for money. But she kind of let the story, you know, when they did the, when they did the interviews, I think she was embarrassed by her own childhood. Her father disappeared. Um, and I think she was just embarrassed by the fact that she didn't have that sort of an upbringing. So but it is a myth. She was, had no connection to the Yale family. Thank you. Yeah. Well, to, to wrap up, a couple of things I was talking about, about Miss Clara Edwards. After she sold the hotel, she moved into uh, an apartment complex next door to Holy Cross and stayed there until that building needed to be redone. Yeah. Uh, and Lefty and Nora 
Nora was his fourth wife, and they got divorced. He finally had a fifth wife. They got divorced and left the <laughs> left trial, but uh, Nora stayed at Little Orchard. She died in trial, and I think uh, this, my story is that her ashes were sprinkled on the lawn at Little Orchard. Oh. I can't vouch for that one. But um, Lefty died in 1959 <coughs> in Camden. But uh, they were all very colorful people and made a great contribution to the life of Triumph. <coughs> Bruce, I'm delighted that we've learned a lot about uh, Scott Fitzgerald here. And thank you for... You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.